Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here. And I know that it's been long three days for you. This is the last talk. I realize it's, uh, it's a lot of information to take in, but um, this talk is going to be relatively short. So please uh, bear with me. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about recordings from uh, same neurons over months with neuropixel screws. Um, all right, so uh, the first question is, why would anyone want to record from the same neurons over days and weeks with neuropixels? And uh, there may be many things that you can answer with this kind of approach. So for example, you may be interested in uh, learning processes. So you can uh, monitor neurons as um, in a naive animal, and then as the animal is learning some task, and then you can record uh, from an animal that is already fully trained. You may be interested in plasticity. So as an example, if you do a monocular deprivation, so you uh, suture one eye of an animal and you can monitor what happens to say visual cortex at that time. And then as the animal recovers from monocular deprivation, what happens then? And there's many, many more examples of why you may want to monitor activity over time. And the one advantage that NeuroPixels can give you is the fast temper resolution as compared to, for example, 2P imaging. So this is a motivation. This is why you may want to do this. And um, uh, sorry, uh, how would you actually check that you are recording from the same neurons? So if you're using two photon imaging, you can just uh, look at your images and see that they uh, look very similar over days. So then you are sure you are uh, tracking the same neurons. With neuropixels, on the other hand, um, you get something like this from your recordings. So let's say image on the left is day one, image on the right is day two. And um, these traces might look similar, but you're not really sure if they come from the same neuron or not. So would you trust an algorithm um, that just tells you, yes, these traces are from the same neuron? Um, well, I wouldn't. I would like to first check this algorithm on some ground truth data to make sure that it's working properly. And then I can use it on um, other data where I might not have ground truth. But if the algorithm is working fine, then I'll trust the results. Um, so how would we get the ground truth data for this kind of um, question? Uh, we might want to use functional properties of neurons um, to check the, um, the performance of the algorithm. So let's say, for example, that we recorded from four neurons on one day, and we found out that they have orientation uh, preference. So neuron one responds a lot to a vertical grading, neuron two responds to a grading tilted 45 degrees, and so on. So uh, then you record on day two, what would you expect uh, to see? How, what responses would you expect to see from these same four neurons? Well, you would expect that the orientation preference wouldn't change very much. Uh, so then uh, this is basically the idea of the talk. And now I'm just going to fill in some technical details of how we actually did this. For this, we used uh, NeuroPixels 2.0, and I'm sure uh, during these three days, you already heard a lot about these probes. So just very, very briefly, these probes have uh, linear geometry. So the sites are located on top of one another, unlike in NeuroPixels 1, where you have this uh, checkerboard pattern. Uh, also, the distance between the sites is smaller. It's 15 microns compared to 20 microns in NeuroPixels 1. And uh, another advantage is that neuropixels do come in two varieties, one shank or four shank. And in the four shank configuration, you can choose recording sites that are located in kind of a stripe. So you will have recording channels at the same depth on all of your four shanks. And this may be beneficial if you're going to record from a structure that is elongated in a horizontal axis. For example, um, if you want to record from a visual cortex as we did. Um, so in order to get recordings that would be as stable as possible, as you just mentioned, we actually cemented the probes. So this means that we cannot um, extract them after the recording and reuse them 
we essentially lose a probe, but we did it on purpose. And as you can see, it did give us very stable results. So we put cement uh, and we attach the probe to the skull of the mouse. And then we also put this uh, 3D printed protective part around to protect it from, you know, if a mouse bumps into walls of a cage. And we implanted these probes in the left visual cortex. Um, it did give us stable recordings for more than 10 months. So here on the X axis is the days since implantation. On the Y axis is depth of the probe and the color code shows firing rates. So the fact that you can see these um, black stripes essentially across different days shows you that if um, some part of the probe was active in the beginning, it kept being active for more than 10 months. So we didn't lose very much. Uh, and on the right, you can see some example clusters from uh, day 198 after implantation. You can see these clusters still look okay. Uh, to characterize exactly how stable these recordings were, here you can see three, three mice that we implanted this way. And on the left uh, are total firing rates, so they are quite stable. And on the right is the cluster count. So now, if we look into more detail, if we zoom in um, to these drift maps, so here uh, every dot is a spike and x-axis is time, um, you can see that the patterns on uh, two recording days may look similar, but it seems like they are shifted along the vertical direction. And in order to compensate uh, for this vertical shift, we used a modified version of a kilosort algorithm that was able to uh, move the recordings such that they matched and then uh, sorted them together to extract spikes across both days. In order to check performance of this algorithm, we showed mice libraries of visual images, natural images. Um, so the library contained 112 images, which we showed them five times on each session. And we showed them in the central and right screen since the probes were implanted in the left cortex. And then we assess the responses. So for each neuron, we can uh, basically see how much it responds to these images. And this example neuron on the left uh, doesn't respond to the first image, somewhat um, res responds somewhat to the second image and responds a lot to the third image on the first recording day and also on the second recording day. We can then color code these um, responses. So um, here red means more responsive. So um, then you can um, put these responses from different neurons together in a matrix. So here on the X, uh, on the Y axis are neurons, on the X axis are images. This is one recording day, this is another recording day, and hopefully you can see that these two matrices look somewhat similar. But how similar are they in reality? So in order to quantify that, these are the plots that we uh, make. And here on the x-axis, I'm showing the uh, unit index, so neuron index. And on the y-axis is the index of the best match to this neuron in terms of visual responses. So what neuron had most similar visual responses to this unit on the second recording day? So if a dot is on a diagonal, it means that this neuron was most similar to itself on the second day. If the dot, on the other hand, is off diagonal, it means that this uh, unit was similar to some other unit on the second recording day. And these gray boxes are um, for shanks. So hopefully you can see that um, in this situation where we have two recording uh, days consecutively, most of the dots, vast majority of the dots are on a diagonal with only a few exceptions. But even if we have two recording days that are two weeks apart, we can still see that most of the dots are on a diagonal, meaning that neurons matched better with themselves. And if we quantify it even further, um, 
here each color is a different mouse and each uh, symbol is a different shank. You can see that if the distance between two recording in days was 16 days or less, then we can successfully monitor 91% of neurons. So 91% of neurons matched better with themselves in terms of visual response. If recordings were three to nine weeks apart, then 65% of neurons were still successfully matched. Um, so just to recap this whole process, we recorded visual responses in two different sessions, then we split them together. We corrected the shifts in data and used KILOSORT algorithm that uh, uses only waveforms of spikes to sort these two sessions together. And then we did ground truth validation where we used the visual responses in the two days to check if the algorithm actually returned us um, neurons that were actually the same on the two days. Anna, can I ask a quick question? It's yeah. from Mega. She asked it in the Q&A. And she asks about the modified version of KiloSort that you used. That is KiloSort 2.5, which everybody can use at this point, right? It was a modified version when we wrote that paper, but now oh, it's a well, well, so it was um, a little bit different than what got published eventually as KiloSort 2.5. So it was a specific version uh, that Marius um, modified for us, for our purpose specifically, to match two recordings together. Uh, but yes, nowadays, so I'm, I'm about to talk about this actually on the Wait, next slide. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so nowadays, um, you can try and use the, uh, what's called PyKiloSort, uh, developed mostly by uh, Kush Banga. So this version of KiloSort um, also solves the same drift problems, but it also is um, efficient in terms of uh, memory usage. So this way you can actually merge more than two sessions together. And here, in fact, I'm showing you 10 sessions merged together. And as you can uh, hopefully see uh, these black lines that go horizontally from one day to another are actually quite well aligned with each other, which means that the algorithm was able to um, correct for any vertical shifts that there were in the data. So yeah, this version is published and, and everyone can use. So to summarize, uh, KiloSort 2.5 or, or PyKiloSort has the ability to track the same neurons across recordings, even when there is drift. We checked the performance of this algorithm using visual responses, and it is doing a good job, specifically if your recordings are less than two weeks apart, then you can uh, trust this algorithm to actually uh, do a good job. And even if you don't have ground truth data, you can still use it. And with that, I'd like to thank people who contributed to this work and thank you for your attention. Fantastic, Anna, great job. Um, I think people would like it if you could put that link to PyKiloSort in the chat so they can click it. Yeah, of course. Because, uh, if, and then uh, there's a few questions and we have a couple of minutes because I only have a couple of slides to show to people then at the end of the course. And so I'll see what's the highest. Um, is it possible? Wait, they're, they're moving. Hang on a second. Do I understand correctly? This is from Desdemona. Do I understand correctly that the recordings are spike sorted day by day separately and then aligned afterwards? No, no. We kill sorted everything together. And this was the initial limitation why we only did two sessions and not 10. This was because uh, KiloSort 2.5 at that point wasn't able to handle all these sessions together. It would crash. But like I said, with PyKiloSort, you can sort many sessions together. Great. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll pick one more question. Uh, um, well, so yes, the first question from Maxwell you. is the same. The idea is, yes, you do concatenate spike GLX section sessions. That's exactly how you do it. So, um, so I'll say yes. And then one more question, and then the rest, it'd be great if you could type the answers, Anna, but here's another yeah. one that you could answer live. Is there a way to ensure that you track the same neurons across sessions in days in other structures, such structures where response properties are not as consistent as in visual areas? What would be a good criterion to evaluate that it's actually the same neuron? 
Yeah, well, so this this was my hope to convince you that you can just basically trust this algorithm. And because we checked it in visual cortex, then you can trust it in other places. But of course, you may say, oh, well, I, um, I don't. So then uh, what can you use? Um, in places that do have functional signatures, you can use the same method. So in hippocampus, for example, you uh, put your uh, mouse or, or rat in a box and you can uh, see what place cells are doing. So if they are the same, then the algorithm is doing a good job. Uh, in places where you don't have that, um, well, you can just open, after, after you've done this sorting together, you can open the neurons in the phi, for example, and you can just look at the waveforms do they look similar to you? Did the amplitudes change much? Did the cross correlate? What is the cross correlation? Oh, well, cross correlation will work. Well, so you you can just look look at them, um, look, uh, compare waveforms, but they should um, essentially be similar if Kilosor thinks that these are similar.